So let's look at the second reading. This is an excerpt from Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologica on the nature of law. Uh, this is from the medieval period, so we're jumping around here. Thomas lived, I think, in the 13th century AD. The most important Christian thinker, perhaps, of all time. A very large work on theology and philosophy, but here we're uh, focusing on law, and, and really we should make sure we understand he's talking about moral law. Uh, and I guess the first idea is, you know, there really is a law, right? Um, this is his particular way of addressing questions. You, you ask a question and then you consider both sides and then you give a kind of a revolution, a resolution, excuse me, his first article is whether law is something pertaining to reason. And of course he wants to say yes. You know, law is rational. Law depends upon reason. That is our capacity to think and to reason and to be rational. Uh, and there's one thing I found particularly helpful here. If I could maybe make it a little bigger. I'm thinking of when he says, I answer that here in the, in the first article. And he's describing what law is. And he says, law is a rule and measure of acts. And this law is that which measures what we do, and that measures it in terms of justice and morality. Law is a rule and measure of acts whereby man is induced to act, that is, 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 is compelled to act, is pushed to act, or is restrained from acting. And law is about either something some rule either telling you to do something or telling you not to do something. Right? I mean, think of the Ten Commandments. Some of them are positive, like honor your father and your mother, and some of them are negative, like like do not steal. Right? So that's the idea of a, a law tells you to do something or it tells you not to do something. And here's what's really interesting. And, and here, you know, the, the words that he's talking about are Latin words. This was originally written in Latin. He says, for lex... And that's the Latin word for law, is derived from legare, to bind, because it binds one to act. So that's actually quite helpful because what he's saying basically is there are certain, and he believes, like real things, rules, what Kant will call imperatives, commands, that come to us naturally that bind us. I mean, that's the whole idea of a law, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that are kind of like laws but aren't as strong, like a suggestion or a rule of thumb or a convention. Well, why don't you try doing it this way? Or why don't you try uh, not doing it? Or, you, you, you know, you should really think about doing this or you should really think about not doing that. That's not law. Law is when you're bound, when you realize that you have an obligation or a duty to do something. And so it, it does raise the issue of, like, you know, where, where can that authority come from that really binds me to do something? Uh, and it's really not until he talks about the various kinds of law in question 91 here that we really get a sense of where that authority comes from because he believes that there are different levels of law. He starts out by asking whether there is an eternal law, and then he asks whether there is a natural law, and finally, whether there is a human law. And um, you know, one way to think of that is that, okay, there is a eternal law, let's say. Where is that? And what is that? Eternal law is God's law. Eternal law is what God thinks. Eternal law is what God wants his providence for the universe. Right? And that is the basis of everything. You know, this is a theological view, right? Ultimately, although Thomas thinks that natural law is reasonable, everything rests upon the existence of God and 
the idea that God wants human beings to, to behave in certain ways. Right? But built, so the, the very basis of everything is eternal law and then built upon eternal law, derived from eternal law, is natural law. And then finally, built upon natural law is human law. So the idea is that all of these things fit together, but that they fit together in this hierarchical structure where one really depends upon the other and depends upon the, la the layer below it, almost like a building. You know, it's a really architectural metaphor. Uh, so you can say the human law depends upon natural law and natural law depends upon eternal law in this sort of one thing built upon another. Well, how so? Well, eternal, if eternal law is really what God wants for the universe, we have to admit that we're not God. We can't understand God. God is infinite. We are finite. So although in the Bible or maybe in other texts he chooses to reveal certain things to us, ultimately we can't understand God. Right? But natural law, what is natural law? Natural law is our partial glimpse of God's law for the universe. Um, what does he call it? Uh, yeah, at the end of his section here where he's describing what it is, he says he thus implies, and he's referring to, I think, uh, I guess the Psalms in the Bible, which I guess would be David, uh, he thus implies that the light of natural reason, whereby we discern what is good and what is evil, which is the function of the natural law, is nothing else than an imprint on us of the divine light. It is therefore evident that the natural law is nothing, nothing else than the rational creature's participation of the eternal law. So you can think of natural law as our basic ability to, to understand right and wrong. And that this is a partial glimpse of the eternal law. Right? We are finite, fallible creatures. But to a certain extent, we participate in the divine essence. And part of that is that we understand through the natural light of reason, uh, God's eternal law. And we understand this by virtue of our, our understanding of certain first principles. And that's what I would end this up here on, right? Um, I'm talking about in question 94, natural law. He says that there are certain, it's generally speaking, it's not, not that difficult. What he's saying in terms of natural law is that there are certain first principles, self-evident first principles. Things that we know without proof. And he talks about you know, in logic and mathematics, there are certain starting points, axioms, you can say, that we start the thing with. And that there are certain starting points, self-evident first principles in natural law, in morality. And he tells us what the, the most basic one is, right? And it's down here where he says... Uh, I'm right in this section here. He says, consequently, the first principle in the practical reason, and practical reason would be like thinking about what we should do, is one founded on the nature of good, viz. that good is that which all things seek after. Hence, this is the first precept, the first rule, the first command, the first guiding principle of law, and that is good is to be done and promoted and evil is to be avoided. That's the important thing. What Thomas is saying is that we all understand this. And we all understand that it's a law for us. That is, it's, it binds us and that 
in a legare, binding sense. The good is to be done and evil avoided. We all, without proof, would accept that. Okay? That's the idea. That's the basic, most fundamental principle of moral reasoning. And it's the starting point of everything, that the good should be done and evil avoided. It is what Thomas believes is that it's absolutely, it's irrefutable, it's undeniable, you might say. We can't prove it, but we don't need to prove it, you would say, because it's so self-evidently true. And this is why, you know, if you look at the, 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 the video on the idea of week one, the big idea, this is why he's an objectivist. He believes that this principle is true for everyone. It's not a matter of custom. It's not a matter of culture or historical period. It's simply something we all accept to be true. And he might be right about that. This is something to think about. It's a philosophy course. You're not, you're not supposed to just accept things. You're supposed to think about, is this actually a, you know, this is what you should think about. Is this actually a self-evident truth? that the good is to be done and evil avoided. I would say, just as importantly, so what? What does that mean, right? That is, it may be true, but it's so general, it's so broad, and it raises so many questions that it may not be useful. And the question that it raises is, you know, okay, what if we accept it? And I would accept it. The good is to be done and evil avoided. Right? It has to be applied. What is the good? And what is evil? Sure, I'm committed to the idea that the good should be done and evil avoided. But what is good? It doesn't answer that question. Right? So there is the problem that it may be true, but it may be so absolutely broad and abstract that we it doesn't really give us any help the last thing i want to talk about about this reading is that he does suggest a way in which we can answer these questions that is what is the good right? we can start to specify this the basic precept of morality that the good is to be done and evil avoided and he has a way of doing it it may not be true but it is a way uh and that's something that he talks about up here. Um, you know, I think he's anticipating that objection. Well, okay, this is so broad. Of course, we all want to do the good, but it begs the question, right? what is the good? We don't know what the good is. We can't assume that we know what the good is. So how do we find out what the good is? By begging the question, I mean, aren't we supposed to establish that something is good rather than just assume that it's good? He has a kind of an answer, and that is this. He says, since, however, good has the nature of an end, a purpose, a goal, and evil the nature of the contrary, it would be against that end, hence it is that all those things to which man has a natural inclination are naturally apprehended by reason as being good. And this is where the theological viewpoint comes in because Thomas believes as a devout Christian that we're all created beings, that you and I were created by God and that God had certain purposes in the way that he made us. So if we have certain natural inclinations, they were put there by God. And so they must, generally speaking, be good or lead us to good. So he says, um, those things to which man, meaning all human beings, has a natural inclination or naturally apprehended by reason as being good, and consequently as objects of pursuit, you know, things that should be pursued in, in accordance with that first precept, and their contraries as evil and objects of avoidance. So what he's basically saying is that we can begin to we, figure out what the goods are that we should be pursued by thinking about what we are naturally inclined towards. What would it be? Uh, how would we do this? Well, we, he, we'll just look what he says. Therefore, the order of the precepts of the natural law is according to the order of natural inclinations. 
For there is in man, first of all, an inclination to good in accordance with the nature which he has in common with all substances, inasmuch namely as every substance seeks the preservation of its own being according to its nature. And by reason of this inclination, whatever is a means of preserving human life and of warding off its obstacles belongs to the natural law. Like you and I have a natural inclination to preserve our own lives. We protect ourselves from danger. We avoid death. What does that tell us? That human life is a good. You're naturally inclined towards preserving it in yourself and others. So what does that mean? Well, one of the goods that needs to be pursued uh, is human life. We should preserve human life. And anything that's a threat to human life is an evil to be avoided. So there's one thing that flows out of that fundamental precept. But there's more. He says, secondly, I'm right here, there is in man an inclination to things that pertain to him more specially, according to that nature which he has in common with other animals. And in virtue of this inclination, those things are said to belong to the natural law which nature has taught to all animals, such as sexual, sexual intercourse, the education of offspring, and so forth. Well, you and I have an inclination towards, like, you know, physical love. Uh, and that's not a bad thing because physical love in one way or another leads to families. Uh, and you know what that, what does that tell us? That families are good. You know, we have a natural inclination to form families. Um, so family is a good and anything that is threatening or harmful to families is bad. So we have another good. The first one is human life. The second one is families. Uh, and so on. That, that is, you see how what he's doing is saying we have some natural inclinations towards some things, and we can use those as a guide to what those goods are that we can specify from that very abstract first principle that the good should be pursued. Uh, finally, what does he say? Thirdly, there is in man an inclination to good according to the nature of his reason, which nature is proper to him. Thus, man has a natural inclination to know the truth about God, to live in society, and in this respect, whatever belongs to this inclination belongs to the natural law. For example, to shun ignorance. You and I, as children, from the very moment we sort of wake up to the world, we have a natural curiosity. What does that tell us? Knowledge is a good knowledge should be pursued and ignorance is a as is an evil that should be shunned and avoided so now we have another good so this is how thomas begins to fill in that very general abstract precept that the good should be pursued and evil avoided is that we can begin to sketch out what the goods are uh, by looking at our fundamental inclinations uh, the last thing what you look at is in the fifth article here where he says whether the natural law can be changed. That is very interesting. Right? And again, here you have to remember that as an objectivist in morality, he doesn't believe that every culture's morality is exactly the same. He's not saying that. Uh, to be a, a Thomas, let's say, in morality is not to believe that morality has to be the same for everyone. He's saying that the very basic principles of morality are the same for everyone. Okay. So basic principles like... Um, Let's say something like this. Um, I'm just doing these off the top of my head. Now, in addition to the, you know, the, like he would say that this,
this all cultures agree to, right? The good should be pursued and evil avoided. That's one thing. Like, can that be changed? No. Maybe some of these more particular things built on that couldn't be changed either. Uh, but it doesn't mean that everything in morality can't be changed. He says here, a change in the natural law may be understood in two ways. First, by way of addition, like adding new laws. And he says, in this sense, nothing hinders the natural law from being changed, since many things for the benefit of human life have been added over and above the natural law. So law can change, and in good ways, by addition. But then there's another way of understanding change, and he says, secondly, a change in the natural law may be understood by way of subtraction, so that what previously was according to the natural law ceases to be so. In this sense, the natural law is altogether unchangeable in its first principles. So certain things are not going to change, right? Uh, it'll never change that the good should be pursued and evil avoided. You know, it'll never change, I would say, that children should be protected and educated. That will be true for all people at all times until the end of the human species, right? Those things will never change. Some things will change in the natural law, but some things won't. I would say this one, too, that truth is better than lies. That if the human species ever gave that up, then we're, we're finished, right? If we ever thought that cruelty was a good thing, we'd be finished. I mean, there are certain things that won't change, whereas other things will. Um, and, you know, the, the question is really, again, one of not the basic principles, which are unchangeable, but how they're applied. So as he says here, but in its secondary principles, which we, as we have said, are certain detailed proximate conclusions drawn from the first principles, the natural law is not changed, so that what is prescribed what it prescribes be not right in most cases, but it may be changed in some particular cases of rare occurrence. That is, how we apply these general principles will definitely change over history, right? Um, you know, cruelty is wrong, but what, it, what constitutes cruelty? That's gonna change according to our best guess. Children should be protected and educated, but what is the best, what does it mean to be educated? And how should we educate children? Truth is better than lies, sure, but um, does that mean that we need to tell the truth in all situations? Probably not. So there's a considerable room for judgment, is what I'm trying to say. But the basic principles like this, no. For an objectivist, they never change.